For those interested in studying mathematical card magic, the first hurdle you will likely encounter is the composition of shuffle permutations and how to correctly use mathematics to compute the net effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards. Many find this counterintuitive and sufficiently frustrating that they just throw in the towel and assume that they'll never understand what the heck is going on. So that is my goal today. Use mathematics to compute the net effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards. And I will show you two procedures, each of which will lead you to the correct answer that agrees with the outcome of the physical shuffles themselves. So let's begin. First, a few definitions to set the stage. Let N sub N represent the ordered set of the first N natural numbers. A packet P of N cards is actually a function from the ordered set n sub n into a set x of playing cards. Notationally, we write functions in this way where p of 1 corresponds to the top card of the packet, p of 2, the second card from the top, p of 3, the third card from the top, and so forth all the way down to P of N, which represents the bottom card of the packet. A packet shuffle is a rearrangement of the cards. If the cards are returned to their original order, we call this the identity shuffle. Corresponding to each physical shuffle S, there is a permutation sigma S on the ordered set n sub n, which means sigma is a bijection from n sub n to itself, meaning it is a one-to-one -one and onto function. On the side here, I've written, we call sigma s the shuffle permutation of the shuffle s. So think of sigma s as the mathematical expression for the physical shuffle S. To mathematically determine the effect of the shuffle S on the ordering of the cards in a packet P, we evaluate the following composition of functions. So here we're viewing P as a function as mentioned a moment ago. More specifically, we evaluate the composition P with sigma S at each of its domain values 1 through N. This is done in the ordinary way. The composition of P with sigma S of 1 is simply P of sigma S of 1, which represents the top card of the shuffled packet. So it's the new top card. P composed with sigma S of 2 is just P of sigma S of 2, which represents the second card of the shuffled packet, and so forth, all the way down to the bottom card of the shuffled packet. Technical note, the composition P composed with sigma S constitutes a right group action of the symmetric group Sn on the set of all packets P, which are really functions from n sub n to x. Informally, this means that the new ordering of the shuffled packet can be obtained by composing the permutation sigma s on the right of the packet function P, that is, the expression that we've been using. I should point out that the opposite order for this composition, if functions are evaluated from right to left, which is customary, does not even make sense. In particular, consider the composition sigma s with p, 
where we assume functions are evaluated from right to left. This composition yields the following chain of domains and codomains. But there is a problem here. Since the statement x going to n sub n by way of sigma s does not even make sense because the domain of sigma s is actually the set n sub n, not x. Remember, sigma s is a permutation on the set n sub n, which means it's a bijection from that set to itself. So there is a mismatch in the codomain of the function p with the proper domain of the function sigma s. So this expression here is not defined. Technical note, the composition sigma s with p would make sense if we agree to evaluate functions from left to right, which is sometimes done. This is not the most common way to evaluate functions. Whereas, if we agree to evaluate functions from right to left, the composition p composed with sigma s makes perfect sense. And, as we will see, it provides the correct new ordering of the packet p after shuffle s has been performed. And we can see this in the chain of domains and codomains for these respective functions. In particular, the codomain of sigma s, which is n sub n, is also the domain of the function p. So this composition indeed makes mathematical sense. The purpose for all of this preliminary explanation is to emphasize that a physical shuffling of a packet of playing cards corresponds to what is called a right group action. Knowing this is essential to correctly computing the net effect of a series of shuffles S1, S2, up to SK on a packet of cards. Here are two equivalent computational procedures for evaluating a composition of shuffle permutations. Suppose a series of shuffles are performed on a packet of n cards. Denote these shuffles by S1, S2, up to SK, and denote their corresponding shuffle permutations by sigma1, sigma2, sigma k. Denote the functional representation of the packet by the letter P. To compute the net effect of these shuffles on the packet, either one of the following procedures can be used. Procedure one, evaluate the composition P composed with sigma one. So this is computing the effect of shuffle one on packet P. Step two, evaluate the composition, the one that you just determined, and compose it with sigma 2. This will give you the net effect of shuffles S1 and S2 on packet P. Step three, evaluate the composition written here, which simply gives you the net effect of these first three shuffles on the packet P. And we can continue this for as many shuffles as we like. Now the point here to realize under this procedure for determining the correct net effect of these shuffles on this packet of cards, this composition is evaluated first. It is important to understand that once we've done this, we no longer have, quote, a permutation of numbers, but we actually have a new arrangement of the physical playing cards themselves. So this actually represents the packet P of playing cards after the first shuffle, S1, has been performed. And since this is now an ordered packet of playing cards, it makes sense to compose this with our second shuffle permutation, which will give us, once again, a new ordering of the packet P. 
and then we just continue on. We compose this new ordering of the packet P with the third shuffle permutation, and so forth. Important observation. Note that for procedure one, the shuffle permutations sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k are applied and computed in the same, I'll underline it here, in the same order in which the physical shuffles S1, S2, up to SK were performed. Okay? Remembering this is essential. So procedure one computes the net effect of these K shuffles and it does so by composing the shuffle permutations with the packet P in the order in which the shuffles were originally performed, okay? Which is very nice. In some ways, it's the most logical. You would think if I perform, let's say, three shuffles, shuffle one, two, three, you would perhaps expect that the composition of the shuffle permutations should take place in that same order, one, two, three. Well, they do here in procedure one, okay? So that's very nice. But that's not the only way to compute the net effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards. Here is a second way. Now the second procedure is probably the most common way of determining the overall effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards but it leads to an evaluation process that is performed in the opposite order to which the physical shuffles were actually carried out. So this is really where a lot of confusion comes. Okay, so let's try to clear this up. Just to emphasize, procedure one on its own works perfectly fine. So a person could always compute the net effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards only using procedure one. But procedure two perhaps is more efficient. Okay, so what I've done here is I've written out the same expression that we had before where we were composing P with sig sigma 1 first and then once we get that we compose it with sigma 2 next and so forth. Well, because function composition is associative, we can rearrange the parentheses in the following way. We can separate the packet P from the shuffle permutations. And this expression here, because of associativity of function composition, can in fact be unambiguously written as P composed with this quote product, or in other words, list of compositions of functions. The reason for rewriting our chain of compositions is to make clear that a second procedure can be employed to compute the net effect of a series of physical shuffles on a packet of cards. Namely, we can compute the string of compositions, sigma 1 with sigma 2 up to sigma k, separately. And then in step 2, we compose our answer on the right with the packet function p. Important observation. To compute the net result of the composition, sigma 1 with up to sigma k, we of course evaluate these functions, really permutations, from right to left, which is the customary way to evaluate functions. But in contrast to procedure 1, the shuffle permutations sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k are computed in the opposite order to which the physical shuffles, S1, S2, up to SK, were performed, okay? So this is where my students get very frustrated. Let's say we perform a Klondike shuffle followed by an LR shuffle, just left, right, 
followed by a 50% coding of the cards. Suppose we perform just those three shuffles. Well, because the Klondike shuffle was performed first, they assume that function should be the first one evaluated to determine the net effect of these three shuffles on that packet. Well, that is only true if this, as we saw earlier, is composed with P, the packet P, and procedure one is followed. If we want to evaluate the net effect of the shuffle permutations themselves, we will evaluate these as done probably in your entire math career from right to left, okay? So just realize if you want to use procedure two, it will feel like you're doing things in the opposite order to which they should be done. But that is actually not the case. Because of the right to left evaluation of the composition of functions. Okay, example. Prove that the KLRC shuffle is the identity shuffle for packets of four cards by applying both procedure one and then procedure two. So let's see both of these procedures in action. Okay, so we're going to first verify the calculations below, and then we will construct this packet of cards to work with. So let's go ahead and derive the functional calculations for the three shuffles K, L, R, and quote C, the 50% coding. Okay, so the way that this is done is we start with an ordered packet, one, two, three, four, and we perform the shuffle. And then we look at the new ordering of the cards to determine the functional assignments of each of the domain values, which are one through four. Okay, the Klondike, how does that work? This is where you hold the cards in what's called Biddle Grip, and you take the top and bottom card off as one, top and bottom card off as one, and look at the new ordering of the packet. And what is the new ordering? The top card is now two, so we would say that our domain value, one, is assigned to two. So position one is assigned to what was in position two. Position two now goes to the th original third card. Position three now goes to the original first card, top card. Position four is again assigned to the fourth original card, okay? So that's just a verification of the effect of the Klondike shuffle on a packet of four cards. And so we would say that this is a, a mathematical description of the effect of the Klondike shuffle. And as we can see, of course, it's a permutation. A permutation is just a bijection. Okay, let's go ahead and verify the LR shuffle. Now do note that we're going to be stacking right on left, okay? And it ends up that if you were to stack left on right, instead of getting the identity function, which we should get, we'll get a packet reversal. But for now, we're focused on ending with the identity shuffle. So we will stack right on left. So how this works is you start with your ordered packet, and now the LR shuffle, you deal left, right, left, right, and now we're going to stack the right pile on top of the left, and we will simply look at the new ordering of the cards, okay? So this is what we get. So the first position is now assigned to card four. The second position is now assigned to the second card, yet again. The third position is also assigned to the original card, which was the third card. And then position four is assigned to the original first card. So this is a faithful description of what happens with the physical shuffle, okay? And then C here represents a 50% coding of the cards. So I'll show you what that is if you don't know already. So you begin with our ordered packet. 50% coding is where you count out half the cards and then drop the rest on top. So let's go ahead and do that. One, two, which is half of four, drop the rest on top. What is the new ordering of the packet of cards? 
Well, it's three, four, two, one. Okay, so that is a description of the shuffle permutation for a 50% coating of the cards. Also, our packet P will consist of the four cards, Ace of Hearts, Two of Hearts, Three of Hearts, and Four of Hearts. Okay, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay, returning to procedure one, let's go ahead and perform each of the four steps which will verify the net effect of these three shuffles on the packet ACE through four. Okay, so recall step one, evaluate this composition here, P composed with sigma K. Now mathematically, this is how we would determine the output for each of the domain values, one through four. Okay, so we have P composed with sigma K of one. What does that mean? That means we find the output for sigma K of one and then evaluate the function P at that output. Well, the output for sigma K one, as we can see over here in our table, is two. So we would just replace this with two and then evaluate P of two. Well, what is P of two? Well, we know what that is from earlier. We're assigning P1, P2, P3, P4 to the corresponding cards, Ace of Hearts through the Four of Hearts. So at this stage in the evaluation of the larger expression, we get an output of Two of Hearts for an input of one. So let's go ahead and physically confirm this outcome. So if we begin with our ordered packet, Ace of Hearts through the Four of Hearts, and perform the Klondike Shuffle, what we should get in the first position is the Two of Hearts. Is that true? Well, let's just check it here. It is indeed. Position one now is assigned to the Two of Hearts. In a similar way, if we evaluate the composition of P with Sigma K at the values two, three, and four, we will get a confirmation of what we see after physically shuffling our ordered packet. So we get a three here, we get an ace here, and then in the last fourth position, the four of hearts stays where it began. Okay, so that's step one. Now step two, from here, that's the key, from here, we will now compose the pair of functions we evaluated up here with sigma LR. Okay, so what we do here is we take this packet and we perform the LR shuffle. Well, what's the LR shuffle? It's left, right, left, right, and recall we're stacking the right pile on top of the left. Okay, so let's check to see what ordering we get out of this. Well, the new ordering is four of hearts, three of hearts, ace of hearts, and two of hearts. And that's what we will get computationally if we evaluate, why don't we just do one of these? So why don't we do it for an input of one? We're computing this composition. Now we have already found the first composition, it's up above. So what we'll have here is we rewrite this in the following way, which is how we evaluate the composition of functions. So what we need to do is evaluate the shuffle permutation associated with the LR shuffle at an input of one. So you come over here and sigma LR evaluated at one is four. And that's what we've written over here. We have a four as our updated computation. And now here, what we can do is just go up above and find where we have already computed this, right? We're looking at P of sigma K evaluated at four. Well, that's the last computation here. And we found it to be the four of hearts. And that's what's listed here. So as you can check, 
each and every one of these are a faithful computation of our previous composition with the LR shuffle permutation. And then, as you might guess, the third step is to now evaluate this. Think of this as just a single function now. We've already found all of the assigned values for this composition for each of the input values, one, two, three, four. We've done it right here. But now we're going to compose this function with the shuffle permutation for the 50% coding shuffle. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so what is this composed now with our new shuffle permutation sigma c? Well, evaluated at 1, this can be written as our previous composition, whose output we know, that function evaluated at this input. Well, what is sigma c of 1? Well, we can see it right here. Sigma c of 1 is 3. So this gets replaced by 3. What does our previous composition evaluated at 3 give us? Well, this is where we use our earlier work. So here it is. We evaluated that composition of three functions at the value 3. And the output was the ace of hearts. Okay. Why don't we just quickly do one more of these. So to evaluate this, the first thing to do is rewrite it as listed in the second line here. So what needs to be done is we simply need to find what is sigma c of 2. Well, we found that to be 4. So it gets replaced by 4. And we've already evaluated this string of compositions at the value 4. It came out to be down here the 2 of hearts. So there you go. And so as you can check, what we will get is we will get the original ordering of the packet P back. And that can be summarized as written here below. So all of this just gives us back the original packet in its original order. Therefore, the KLRC shuffle is the identity shuffle in this particular case. Now, as an aside, I want to mention that the KLRC shuffle, in which the right pile is stacked on top of the left, which is what we've done here, will always, now this is important, will always be the identity shuffle for any even-sized packet of cards. And if you look at the nature and the effect of each of these shuffles individually, it really is quite surprising that their composition would always give you the identity shuffle. In the case of R on L for the stacking, and in the case of even-sized packets of cards. Now, I could also add to that, this shuffle here, if we were to stack the left pile on top of the right, actually gives you a packet reversal, which in the study of cyclic and mirrored structures is a perfectly acceptable outcome to occur because cyclic and mirrored structures are invariant under packet reversal. Okay, so that's interesting as well. So in either case, whether you stack the left pile on top of the right within the LR shuffle, or the right pile on top of the left, you'll get either the identity shuffle or packet reversal, which is very, very nice. Okay, now quickly going on to procedure two, which I've stated is probably the most common way for people to determine the net effect of a series of shuffles on a packet of playing cards, we would need to do the following. So here, what we do is we compute the string of compositions, and then once we know the effect of the composition of all three, we apply that to the packet P. Well, to know the combined effect of all three permutation shuffles here, we have to evaluate this composition at each of its inputs. Okay? If we evaluate it at 1, it would look like this. So first off, remember, evaluation of functions will be done from right to left. 
So here what we would do is we would need to evaluate sigma c of 1, which we can see from our chart over here is 3. So that's why there is a 3 in the parentheses now. The next step now is to write this as sigma k of sigma lr of 3. Well, what's sigma lr of 3? Come over to our chart. It's 3, so that's why we have a 3 replacing that expression. Now, what's sigma k of 3? Well, come over to our chart, and it comes out to be 1. So what we have shown then is that the composition of these three shuffle permutations evaluated at 1 gives us 1. In a similar way, we're going to get 2 out for an input of 2, 3 out for an input of 3, and 4 out for an input of 4. So why don't we just do one more of these. So sigma k composed with sigma lr composed with sigma c evaluated at 2 can be written this way. What is sigma c of 2? Come over to our chart. It's 4. So there you go. We have a 4 in the parentheses. Now this function can be rewritten in this way, where now we need to find sigma lr of 4, which we see as 1. So it gets replaced by 1. And now what is sigma k of 1? Come over to our chart here, and we get 2. So the composition of these three shuffle permutations evaluated at 2 is 2. And then as you can check, the evaluation of that same composition at 3 gives you 3, and evaluated at 4 gives you 4. So what that tells us then is that this composition of shuffle permutations is actually the identity permutation. Remember, this is a permutation on the set 1, 2, 3, 4. And in this case, the combined effect of these three permutations is the same as the identity permutation. It leaves its inputs alone. And then finally, step two, we simply compute the final composition, P, composed with what we just found. Well, since this is the identity permutation on N4, we simply have this. This statement here is the same thing as P composed with the identity permutation on N4, which gives us P. So hence, the KLRC shuffle is indeed the identity shuffle on this packet P of four cards. To finish, I thought I'd give you a bonus result, namely, the KLRC shuffle yields similar results for odd size packets. Okay, so everything we've talked about so far is actually true for all even size packets. The KLRC shuffle is the identity shuffle or the reversal shuffle for all even size packets. Well, guess what? This same KLRC shuffle gives you the same outcomes but with a small modification. Namely, when we perform the shuffle C, of course, with an odd size packet, it won't make sense to deal out 50% of the cards because an odd size packet is not divisible by two. But if we just make one little change in the place of dealing out, quote, half the cards, what we do is we deal out n plus one cards where the packet size is assumed to be 2n plus 1, okay? So in some sense, you can think of it as like dealing out one more card than we normally would in the case of an even size packet. Now that's not quite true, but you can see that with 2n plus 1, dealing out n plus 1 cards is one more than the remaining number of cards, which would be n, right? So that is a very interesting thing, that we can get the same sort of outcome by making that small adjustment. Moreover, for the LR shuffle stacking, left on right, we get the identity shuffle, whereas if we stack the right pile on top of the left, within that LR shuffle, we get a packet reversal. So those two results just switch 
from what we saw from even size packets. But the important point is the KLRC shuffle can be performed in such a way that it either gives you the identity shuffle or a packet reversal for any size packet. And that is amazing. As an exercise, I encourage the viewer to verify all of this for a packet of five cards by applying both procedure one and procedure two as already demonstrated. So thank you for watching and take a look at other videos on the Hidden Structures channel. And in particular, if you're serious about mathematical card magic, you may want to look at some of the playlists dealing with Bessie sequences and Bessie shuffle diagrams. So thank you again.